Hi, in this video, we're going to take a look at parameter tuning for supervised learning models. All right, so what we're going to talk about are just a, a couple of different approaches of going through and fine tuning the model. Now, notice that we're using tuning, not entire rebuild. Well, you know, so think about like a car. If a car has horrible problems, tuning the engine isn't going to solve the problem. Tuning is to is to improve what's already working, what's already a decent model. Now, the reason I'm saying this is that when you get into the position that you're working on a, a project for industry and that your accuracy is not good enough of your supervised learning model, don't use parameter tuning to try and get you like great benefits. Parameter tuning is just for fine tuning, but just a little bit of improvement, not a lot. Fine Parameter tuning is actually a very small, should be very small, in the importance of your project. Where you're gonna do it for sure. Definitely, you're gonna try and get better parameters, but that's not gonna be the thing that delivers high quality predictions. It's really gonna be, number one, your data quality, then your data prep, then your model structure. After that, parameter tuning will just tweak it a little bit to do you fine tuning to improve your model. And so when we talk about our model quality, First one that we want to worry about is the quality of our data, our data prep, and then the structure of our model in that order. And then parameters come after that. And so our the idea of this video is that I've got a model structure that I'm considering. I want to tune it to be a better model and potentially use it if it, uh, if it does a better job than other possible models. All right, so every single model structure will have different parameters. And the approach I'm going to present here works for any model structure that has uh, different ways of, or different parameters to be fit. So let's run through some examples. So let's first of all, prepare a workspace. And so I'm minimizing the number of digits printed, avoiding scientific notation and suppressing warnings, clearing my workspace, and I'm going to be using piping so I'm pulling in the Mercator package. Now I'm gonna be using the, the Kaggle data set for house prices. In a previous video, I prepared the data uh, so that uh, everything's you know, ready to go. I did binning on uh, categorical predictor variables and I used Boxcox or Yo Johnson uh, you know, transformations as appropriate on the numeric predictor variables. Here are the predictor variables that I've reduced down to not my short list, but the, this is a better, you know, this is like my initial pass at feature selection is in this vector here. All right, so the first one I want to talk about is grid search. So a grid search is where I have, I have some parameters of interest and I'm just going to iterate through possible potential values. And so I might have like three different values. I'm going to try of the first parameter, five different uh, parameters, five different values of the second parameter. And if I only have two parameters, that's going to be a total of 15 models built. And of those 15, whichever one has the best validation set, best validation statistics, that's going to be the model that I'm going to consider using. All right, so grid search is where we, you know, you can think of it as I have a grid of values and I'm just going to go over that entire grid. So now I'm going to show using the carrot package and a heavy, heavy workhorse of the carrot package is the train function. It handles a lot of uh, supervised learning projects for us. A lot of aspects of it are handled very quickly, very easily for us. And so when we do grid search with the train function, all I have to do is specify how long of a grid do I have for each individual parameter? So now if a parameter only has like two levels, so let's say I'm talking about, you know, entropy or Gini index or extra trees or something like that for, uh, for a tree model, if I specify five as the length, it's gonna go ahead and, you know, iterate that through those, uh, it'll reduce it down to the limited possibilities. The, the train function does a good job of figuring out like best practices for us. The default setting for uh, the tune length is three. So what we can do is I can just tell the train function how many 
values to just try for each parameter. Here I'm choosing five, the default is three. And so what's gonna end up happening and on all the examples, I'm gonna use the ranger function because I love random forests and ranger is fast. It's gonna go through and it's going to you know try different values. So here it's got two, seven, 12, 17, and 22 are the number of predictor variables tried. That's five different levels. And now our split rule could either be variance or extra trees. And there's only two levels. I said five, but it just goes with two because that's less than five. And so we can see we have all these different uh, parameters were tried. So there are 10 models that were built by that, that, chunk, that chunk of code. Now notice that the root mean squared errors, the R squared, and the mean absolute error are all like pretty tight. You know, it's, it's not a big difference. So this is this supports what I, I've been saying about parameter tuning. Only this tuning, it doesn't make it that big of a difference as long as I have reasonable parameter values. And so here, we would say M try of seven with split rule of variance gave the best model by uh, root mean squared error. So this would be the model of the, of these 10 that I would choose to use. All right, now, something that will happen is that the train function, most of the time, it limits its, its attention to only the most important parameters for the, for the function, for the, the model structure. And you'll notice that minimum node size was kept constant at five. Now, I can go in and I can alter that to make min node size as actually a parameter that is tried uh, in the different uh, in the different iterations of the model. So I could go through if I was to modify the function call so that min node size and m try and split rule were were tried. I would have, and once again, if I leave it at five, then I would have five for m try, five for min node size and then two for split rule. That would be 50 models being built by the function. Now we can also use the train function by specifying a grid of values. So let's say that I want to take control of what's going on. So here I've got M try for two, 12 and 22. I just picked those values. Minimum node size is of two, 15, 30, and then split rule of variance and extra trees. And so here I'm specifying what the grid is going to be. This is going to be a data frame with 18 rows, each row corresponding to uh, the parameters of a model. All right, so the expand grid function takes all possible combinations of the three times three times two possibilities. So 18. And this will go through all the different possibilities of it. All right, so how I typically use this in real life is that I'll run just default settings just to get a feel for what looks like it's gonna work out. And then I'll go a little bit deeper by specifying, I'll, I'll look to see where did I have good values in the previous run where I, uh, you know, just on the default. And then I'll set up a grid with values close to where I had like the optimal one on the previous run. That's how I typically use this. And so the, We'll, we'll generally start out with like a very, very coarse grid, like very spread out values, just trying to find like a region in higher dimensional space of what the best parameters are. Then I'm going to start taking more control of things and specifying what the actual values are to be tried. And that's when the specified grid is very useful. And so here we can see all the different models that are built. Notice that each M try appears six times. So there's 18 different models. And we can see here what the root mean squared error of each one. Oh, now, uh, this will be, uh, th this is a boot. So by default, the train uh, function uses bootstrap on each of these models. So it samples with replacement rows of data and it, it samples a number of observations equal to the number of rows. And so the accuracy is assessed on the holdout data set. So when I do bootstrap, 
some rows get picked more than once. And so since some are getting picked more than once, some are getting left out. Those ones that are getting left out are being used to assess the accuracy of the model. All right, and so we can see that our best model was, see, we had min node size of two, M try of 12, and extra tree. So here is our best model from this iteration. Now, here are some best practices when you're working with the user specified grid. So, first and foremost, if I notice that an extreme value was one of my, my best performers, then you know what? I'm probably going to want to expand it. So, let's say hypothetically that I have a parameter that could take any real value from, you know, one to to infinity. Well, I and I pick, you know, one, five, and 10. And then 10 is the best. 10 was that maximum value. Well, if I have a maximum or minimum value from my grid comes out as the best, I probably want to keep trying in the direction, try more extreme values, keep on expanding out until I'm pretty, until I overshoot what looks like it's optimal. Now, also, something that will come up is that, you know, we can have random number generation involved in building models. And it's a good idea to, to actually set your seed when you do your model building. I've had a situation where I built a model that had really good uh, validation statistics. And it, it was, uh, I think it was random forest. And when I was like real excited, found my parameters, but I didn't save the model. And when I went back, I couldn't re I couldn't achieve that level of accuracy a second time. That was very frustrating. Now, sometimes some models are going to have a lot of parameters. I mean, a lot of them, and it's going to end up that this grid search idea is just going to take too long. And in those situations, we're better off just actually randomly picking values and going through and building a model instead of, uh, of having a grid search. So a grid search is exhaustive on the grid, but it's gonna end up that a lot of times that it's, it, there's a lot of effort on, th on iterations that end up not being useful. And so we can actually frequently do better, especially when we have a lot of parameters by doing a random search uh, for the parameter. So if I put in the train con control parameter, and I put search equals random, it will go through and do a random search of the parameters for us. And so now I didn't specify the tune link, so it went with a default of three, but you can imagine me, you know, greatly increasing the value of this. And so we can see, you know, it just randomly picks some values for minimum node size, M try and split rule. Now we can also do Bayesian optimization. Now, my opinion is that you're, you should not use Bayesian statistics or a Bayesian approach unless you're in a small data situation. If I have a large amount of data and a reasonable prior, my prior is gonna have very little influence on what's going on. And so it's not worth the effort, it's not worth the time, it's not worth the computational you know, time waiting, it's not worth the complexity of a Bayesian model if I have a good amount of data, if I'm in a sparse data situation, then in those situations, a reasonable prior will, will provide, rel compared to the data, a lot of information. And in those situations, I feel like Bayesian, the Bayesian approach is a good way to go. Now, typically when we're doing supervised learning, we don't have uh, a, a shortage of data to that, to the extent that Bayesian would be worth it. So, I almost never use Bayesian statistics unless it's in like a, like I'm, I'm just very, very little data to work with. We do have a, uh, the option of it for Bayesian optimization and we can run through it um, using the machine learning Bayes optimization package. Uh, I ended up, this version of the package is not, uh, is not available for the version of R on my machine. I had to pull this from GitHub, by the way.
And so, you know, this took a long time to run. Bayesian models take a long time. They're, they're mathematically more complicated. They give a more complete representation of the situation. That is nice. But for the purpose of making predictions, I feel like it's just not really worth it. All right, now, after I've built my models, and so remember, each of these, I've got multiple models to consider. And I'm going to go through, and I'm going to evaluate my model, and I'm going to can, can, can compare them. And so in when, when I'm using the uh, train function, it automatically sets up a training set, that's bootstrap, validation set of what's left out from the bootstrap. So to have a test set, I have to have a holdout set that I'm leaving on the side. And so the training set is what we build our model with. Validation is for model selection. And the test set is to estimate model performance. All right, so something that's going to happen, if I built 100 models in the process of, uh, of, of, model, of building my model, it's just going to be by happenstance that a model is just going to look better than it's actually going to perform just because the combination of data and model, it's just going to by happenstance work out that a particular model, one of them, it's just going to look better than it's actually going to perform. And so the more models I build, the more I can expect my validation statistics to be optimistic. Training statistics will always be optimistic. Validation if I'm using my validation set to choose my actual model, well, I've got a hundred models and I, I picked the one with the best validation statistics. Well, yeah, it's like if it, it can, the, the model can only do worse than, than what it did in the past because I'm picking the best one. And because of that, we need that holdout set, that test set to get an honest estimate of how the model will perform. And so here I'm going through and I'm, you know, getting the predictions off of the models that I built. And so something that's nice from the training function, if I if I drop the training output into the predict function, it automatically grabs the best model from all the models that it fitted. Now here I'm getting the residuals from the model, from the train function. And now I'm going to evaluate my models. All right, so now, First and foremost, my validation. So I use validation to tell me which model is the one that I would actually launch for production. And so here, this is indicating that the one that was built off of the tune length is, has the best uh, mean squared error. And then second is the one with, from the grid and the worst one is the random, which isn't surprising since it only did three models. Now. We always want to double check our train and validation statistics. If I see a big gap, that's an indication of overfitting. And so here, this is actually a decent gap. So off of these models, I have I am concerned that I've overfit my models. And I would actually want to go and back off of some things. Specifically, I would want to have fewer, uh, uh, fewer predictor variables. From running through different models in uh, the course of these videos, I've realized that some of those predictor variables could be kicked out. So my first step to uh, prevent myself from overfitting would be to reduce the features in the model. Then I go through this process all over again. All right. So for your homework, go out and build and do parameter tuning of a model structure of your choice. Don't do uh, regular linear regression because there's nothing to tune. That's automatically optimized by least squares. Uh, but other, otherwise, go out, try different parameters, and happy hunting. So that's all I've got for you. Life is short. Do math.